For all the attendees today, uh, again, my name is Ethan. I'm with Burkhardt, and along with my amazing colleague, Daniel Carlo, he is actually chiming in from our testing room in next door. And um, <laughs> so today, uh, the, the whole reason behind, I would say, our October warm-up campaign is because I think as a former student, and Dan, you know, you can uh, uh, chime in as well, um, October is such a crucial month for students because of, uh, you know, the audition season coming up, all the pre-screens and everything that people have to prepare. And, um, and also just with the current, you know, situation that people, people really need to be inspired. And so I, we're so grateful to have four artists this month that have, uh, graciously <laughs> um, uh, shared their talent with us. And our first one is Dr. Catherine Ramirez. And um, Catherine, why don't you share a little bit with us, tell us a little bit us about you and also your warm-up method. And today on my screen, there are seven different uh, documents. So kind of walk us through the blueprint of your warm-up routine, and then uh, let's get started. And also just want everyone to know that um, today's session is being recorded for internal archival purposes only. And um, throughout the warm-up, please have your flute ready warm up with us, but do mute yourself. And also, if you have any questions, we strongly encourage you to put in the chat room box. Daniel and myself will be monitoring the chat box. If any question that's relevant to the warm up that we're doing, we'll try to ask Catherine and if Catherine, if you can answer live and then other than that, we'll just save all the questions till the very end. All right, so Catherine, take it. All right. Thanks, Ethan. And thanks, Daniel. And thanks, Burkhart, Flutes and Piccolos. This is such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here with you all and uh, to share a little bit of what I've learned um, throughout the years uh, regarding warming up. Um, so my background is that I'm from El Paso, Texas, started flute um, in the sixth grade band, originally wanted to play clarinet, but they had too many clarinetists. So I, the band director said, here, try flute. So I did, and I fell in love. Um, and I just went through the band program in Texas until I met Melissa Colgan Ablin, uh, my first teacher when I was a senior in high school. So I had lessons starting then. And then um, she had to drop me after a semester because she was working on her doctorate at the time. <laughs> um, but we have remained very close throughout this whole time. And she's one of my favorite people in the world and a wonderful mentor to me. And I'm really just grateful to her uh, for starting me off well um, in private lessons uh, at that time. Uh, then I went on to study with Gary Woodward at, at Occidental College in LA. Uh, and then uh, I'll just do a quick, like, where I went. Um, after that, I went to Italy for a year to study with Marzio Conti, uh, did a, a diploma there. Uh, then I went back to El Paso and just freelance, taught a little bit, entered a competition. And one of the judges was Ronald Roseman, who taught at Queens College in New York. So he said, you should apply to Queens. I got in, started studying um, with Linda Chesis first, but then I switched to Tara Helen O'Connor, uh, who I completed the degree with, the degree with and, um, and she was just so fabulous. Uh, actually, at that time, I had I'd made that switch in teachers. I had come off an injury, like tendonitis related, and she basically started me over, like from breathing. And um, a lot of these exercises here came from that time, usually like out of out of injury or something. <laughs> I learned a lot of these warm-ups. Uh, then I went on to Yale to study with Ransom for a second master's degree. Then I went to Chicago, freelanced for a few years, went back to El Paso because I was too cold, and then <laughs> uh, taught middle school, uh, played with the symphony and the opera, and taught at a little private school there as well. And then Rice, doctoral program opened up and I applied there and got to study with Leon Baisi for the doctorate. 
And um, after that, I just, I got the job here at St. Olaf in Minnesota. And I've been here now, this is my 10th year. So. Wow, that is everywhere, Catherine. <laughs> I know, it's not a straight line. I've kind of jumped around a lot in my, in my careers, you know. That's amazing. Career. Learning. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a bit to go through today. Yes. So why don't we start? Um, and I see the first page on my screen is Moise. Yeah, so um, just to, I, I put out here like seven different books that I use. Um, and I don't use them all, all the time. But I do like to, um, like the basic things that I, I use a lot are harmonics you know, low register tone, um, something in the high register diminuendo and articulation. Those are the big things that I, I like to warm up with. Um, and so we'll go through these, um, but I wanted to share a little equation that I posted on Facebook today. Um, and I think it kind of sums up where all this is gonna go uh, or where I hope it will go. Um, but let's say you take, you start your day how do you start your day? Well, when you start your day practicing, I think it's important to have an attitude of humility. Because with humility, we can have curiosity. Um, we're not the greatest thing, like we can always improve, there's always something we can improve. So kind of approaching your, your practice, your warm up with with a sense of um, I can be teachable, I think is important. And so I'd like to think of, okay, get into the attitude of teachableness first. Uh, then finding your center balance, you know, like how, how you are situated spatially in the world, where you feel your weight is in your body. All of that can amplify your resonance. And so teachableness, your resonance, those are the th first two things. Then we, as we go get going and playing, you want to make sure you have ease, you know, in the jaw and the throat. Uh, I'm still working on the eyebrows, but um, the eyebrows, uh, your shoulders, your fingers, you want to have ease in the body. And with that ease comes efficiency. And together, those things, I think, produce the freedom. So we've got teachableness, we've got resonance, and we've got freedom coming into play. Then as we go, um, we also start to build up strength, you know, with our ab muscles, you know, you start to feel the power of the, of the air stream coming from your core. Uh, and then with that strength can also come flexibility. You don't want to just be a rock. You want to be able to maneuver through octaves, etc. And I think those two things can create the power. And so all these four things, teachableness, resonance, freedom and power i think if we add those up those can come to equal what i like to think of as truth and integrity and i think those are the most important qualities to have to be kind of a vessel what i like to call a vessel for the divine and that can be whatever you would like it to be for me it's like a connection with god to, it's also a connection to be open to receiving revelation, discoveries, like finding connections where you didn't think there were any, um, finding a way to connect and maybe put yourself in someone else's shoes. All those things, I think, truth, integrity can help you become that vessel for the music to come through you and, come, and, and move through you and out of you and touch someone else's heart. So with all those things in mind, um, I usually start my practice session with some kind of an improv, um, just to get a sense of where the flute is, where I am. So my flute's kind of cold, but let's try it here. Uh, usually low register, something kind of easy, and usually like open intervals, nothing too, uh, nothing too crazy here.
already I can tell like, oh, it feels pretty good. Low registers resonating. My body, my arms are a little tired. Um, I was helping my husband with a, a patio the other day, <laughs> stomping. <laughs> and so I feel like, oh, my shoulders are like, wow, I actually used them. Okay. So um, I'm going to, and since I'm sitting, I'm going to try to make sure that my sit bones are even and that I'm, I'm going to try not to slouch. I like to kind of slouch sometimes when I'm on the computer. I don't like it, but I mean, it happens. So um, I'm going to try to make sure that my sit bones are even and that my spine all the way up through my neck and head are kind of balanced on those sit bones. And all of a sudden, when I take a breath, it's like, oh, I'm free, you know? And so maybe everyone could try that too. If you're standing, then you wanna balance on your feet, your heels and, and the ball of the feet, same, you know, that make sure you're not rocking side to side. But yeah, like finding that balance. Um, we can actually start with this Moise exercise. So if you, this is from Marcel Moise, uh, Comme j'ai pu maintenir, maintenir ma forme, how I stayed in shape. And this is a wonderful book. Um, and if we scroll down, I just put two little clips of exercises and they're the same kind of exercises. They're just two notes uh, at a time. And with this one, I'd like us to start with just playing as comfortably and at ease as possible in that mid register, uh, starting with that mid register B. Really feeling that air, kind of warm air moving through your throat. And with this one, I like to play this one at like 30, like super, super slow. I was like, wait for the, <laughs> when's it coming? Okay, there you go. All right, so I like to do it really slowly uh, so that I can have enough space in my mind to be able to observe what's going on in my body. Okay, and what's going on with my tongue. Just make observations, not really try to control anything yet. So here we go. Mm. Do that again. Going on. Repeat. So that kind of gets us started with the crescendo. It's a very light crescendo into the next half step. And um, in Moise's original manuscript, he has a little square over, for example, the B flat in that first measure. And he's got a tenuto under the low A. And in the directions, it says he, he wants us to aim for the same qualities on both of those notes as we crescendo to them. And so it's kind of a tone development exercise, but it could also be kind of like a meditative exercise to just sort of become aware of what's going on in your body. So that's what I like to use that one for. Uh, the same kind of thing happens in the upper register. You have, I, I added little crescendos. Um, you don't necessarily have to do them because we automatically sort of crescendo as we ascend, um, but it's something to keep in mind. So I, I'll just play a little bit of the, um, the second exercise and you can join me. I'll start just right on it. So here we go. After the long C, here we go. Rest. And so on. Yeah, so I like this one uh, because it's just so slow. Like I can really think about things. We can go ahead and go to the next uh, scan here. So this is another kind of version. 
that I like to try in the low register when I'm just starting out. If not that one, then likely this one. Uh, this is another Moise exercise. Uh, this one is at 60, and I usually take it around then, sometimes a little slower. Um, the reason I don't always start with this one is because of that tritone. Like sometimes I just don't want to start my day with a tritone. <laughs> Oh gosh, like it's already, I mean, we have the news all the time and the, okay, let's start with this. So, but if I can take it, if I'm like in a positive mood and I can like hold myself up, then I'll start with this one. And uh, with this one, I like to just be as smooth as possible going through those really awkward intervals. So like, mm. can go on. Um, that's letter A. Letter B is similar with more of an obvious crescendo. Uh, we can skip that one for now. D goes on to um, go from mid-register ascending to just that first octave above and uh, into pianissimo. And then A1, which I put last, goes from mid-register to the highest register. Um, so I kind of revert, you know, change the order a little bit. Um, but those are are really good, especially like um, when I when I feel like I've gotten through a nice low register warm up to maybe gradually go up, or sometimes just take the jump all the way up to the high register. Uh, you'll notice some of my markings, uh, and I write a lot in my music. So if you see something that you have a question about, feel free to ask me. I'm happy to share. Um, this a uh, a u a u on a one. That's actually from something that I learned from Lorna McGee at one of her recent uh, Zoom master classes uh, that, that happened, uh, University of North Texas sponsored her. Um, and I thought that was a really great idea. So I wrote it in, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, are the vowels that I would use there. Um, and it's it's a really, I think it's a really good way. I had also thought about just uh as a vowel to use for the whole thing. But it's really great to try different things because you learn. thing I wasn't quite happy with so I'll do that again so there's a little bit of um it wasn't as clean on that last one so I'll need to relax a little bit more kind of in my jaw I'm noticing so anyway those are just variations so we can go to the next slide so this is oh I love this book Tone Development Through Extended Techniques by Robert Dick. So Tara Helen O'Connor, a fabulous flutist in New York, a fabulous teacher, uh, taught me about this book. Um, actually, at the time when I was studying with Tara, uh, we had started over. Um, on the floor, I was just breathing and doing harmonics for like three months. So um, this was a really... Uh, well-known exercise to me at the time because <laughs> I was working on this only for a long time. Um, 
what I like to do with this one, and, and Robert Dick is so brilliant, he's put in there the vowels that actually help make these notes come out well at the dynamic that's marked. Uh, so starting with kind of an ooh, ah, ah, as you go up into the high register is a great way to, to try this. Uh, if you actually scroll down a little more, it's a variation on this exercise taking um, just like the fundamental to the fifth or the you know just doing little chunks of these harmonic the, the harmonic series at a time with a different um, with a different um, ha uh, sorry dynamic scheme so I think I'm going to try that one actually so let's go I don't know if you can scroll down a little bit more that no it doesn't go down anymore If not, that's okay. We can just do the other one. I saw another, I saw a little bit of the comments just now about airspeed. <laughs> it's all about the airspeed. And kind of getting out of your own way too, because sometimes when we have a bump anywhere between uh, the harmonics, that let's say we're trying to, um, here, I'll show you once we get this, uh, Thanks for trying this different ways. If it doesn't show up, that's all right. We could just we could just work with the first one. Okay, let's just work with the first one then. All right. Um, something else I learned recently with um, another masterclass was with Dennis Buryakov's masterclass. Um, he says that he tunes the the octaves when he's doing harmonics. He's he's really focused on tuning the octave. And then um, everything else seems to fall in line. Who knew, right? So like in the first, uh, we'll, we'll do this first C. So if you're going from this mid register C to the high register C, and I'd encourage you to have a tuner, um, is to really get those in tune before you try to blow through to the high G. So hang on, I feel like I have tension right here in my jaw. So I'm going to try to do this slack jaw, kind of relax the jaw, which also kind of helps relax the tongue and the root of the tongue here. So to be really easy, almost like create a double chin. Yeah. That. And obviously the high G is very flat with this harmonic fingering but when you switch it to the real fingering it's going to be more in tune which is which is really amazing so you don't even have to really aim so high i think a lot of the times if we aim actually slightly lower than what we're used to as we go into the high register we get more, um, we get closer to being in tune, if not in tune, and we also get a richer tone. So that's something to consider as you're doing the harmonic exercises. Okay, um, let's see. Should we go on to the next one? I just want to make sure we have enough time for everything. Oh my gosh, Peter Lucas Graf checkup. So Peter Lucas Graf was Emmanuel Payud's teacher, and he has this amazing book, and I think more people should be aware of it. Um, I think I included like four or five uh, excerpts from this one. So let's maybe work through these a little quickly. So this is economical breathing. Um, and uh, I love his, in, his instructions about just, you know, br breathe in a relaxed manner, uh, quickly, quietly, gradually. So let's try that. Um, I'll start, we can go ahead and start on the very beginning there, that low C whole note.
That's such a good one. I love that one. So you basically just tank up as full as possible and try to control as you follow the directions for the dynamics. Uh, if you are starting your day kind of sleepy, um, do what my first teacher told me uh, at times like that, summon it. Summon the will to get going on their day. <laughs> this one will wake you up. If um, if you ever have a uh, if you ever start your practice kind of sleepy, start with this one. Oh my gosh, that's so good! I feel like ah, I feel pumped. Okay, so if we scroll down, because there's so much in this book, I mean it's amazing. I think everyone should get it. this. Is a Peter Lucas Graf checkup. All right, so this is another harmonic exercise. If we actually scroll to the bottom of this one, um, he does something a little different, which I kind of like. Um, he alternates between the harmonic fingering and the natural fingering, like the normal, the normal fingering. So like for this uh, three lines from the bottom here, that B flat, let's try that one. So you'll use the regular B flat fingering to get those first five notes. And then once you are tying into the eighth notes, you'll switch, you'll alternate between the B flat harmonic fingering and the regular F fingering. Uh, remember, don't try to correct the intonation on the harmonic because the fingering usually takes care of it. Here we go. foundation i think that's the thing that i love about harmonics is that they keep you connected to the foundation if we fly up into the high register without staying connected some way to where we just came from we're going to be just like a head floating in space with no resonance in our body and um we'll just it just keeps that wonderful depth to the tone so these are fantastic for that let's keep going this is we're on a roll here now all right, so sing and play. Sing and play is a fantastic technique. If you don't know yet how to do it, um, do your best to try to start learning um, because it helps kind of keep the, the larynx and the vocal cords independent of what we do on the flute. Uh, and a lot of times we, when we get tension in the throat, it's because we want to kind of match what we're doing as far as our pitch on the flute, try to match it in our voice. Um, and sometimes we overcompensate. And when we do that, we actually kind of thin out the sound a little, we choke ourselves off. So um, sing and play is really great uh, technique to use. Um, we start with the flute, playing the flute, and we sneak in the voice, just tap, tap, tap. So something like this. <laughs> to the part where you weren't singing anymore you noticed a little bit of a difference maybe a little more freedom in the sound hopefully let's try one more uh, another thing that might help is slide or glide your voice between the notes that sometimes helps too uh, let's try the e flat <laughs> notice I had to flip the octave because my voice couldn't go that low and that's totally fine 
Uh, yeah, so sing and play is another one that I like to do. You could also try it with flutter. Uh, oh, sorry. So that's another way to get the air moving independently. All right, here we go. Going on. So while I scroll down, Catherine, after you flutter and you sing, there's definitely more clarity and resonance in your sound, even coming from my end. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the flutter really liberates. If you ever have to play piccolo, a great warm up for piccolo um, is to just flutter through any kind of intervals. Uh, it's a, just a great way to get the air speed moving um, and and feeling that little because remember we don't need as much air dumping into the piccolo as we do in the flute uh, and so like just getting that sensitivity I think really helps okay actually um, how much time do we have we have about 10 to 15 minutes okay could, let's go ahead and go to the next one. So anyway, before we go, let, let's just scroll through these. So whistle, whistle tones, whistle sounds are amazing. Uh, they really help you pinpoint uh, where you need to be, where your sweet spot is basically on the chimney of the flute. Um, actually, if we scroll down to the bottom, there's some shorter ones. Uh, let's see, yeah, at the very end, this last line, uh, this is this is another one that we could try. So like, nor N is for normal, W is for the whisper or whistle sound, and then back to normal. So like for that D flat, you know, we'll do normal. And then whisper sound. these last ones especially not because they're shorter actually the, the first ones are really amazing to play too but because we kind of really uh get a sense of not having to move so much our our angle between the high and the low like they're like the same so it's really wonderful to just get a sense of those boundaries like oh where is my d flat oh it's not that far from the high d flat yeah Okay, going on. Um, this is just a quick look, and we'll probably just switch to the next one. Actually, we could go ahead and switch to the next one if you want. Switch to the um, next slide. Yeah, next slide. Just because the one that I had put on the, um, or actually, we could go to the next one and then come back to Stallman. I think for no, actually, maybe it's the last one that I sang. Yeah, we'll do some Gobert, Tafnel Gobert. <laughs> okay. Um, so the last one that I included on the checkup could also be applied to anything that you do uh, in, in any other like scale kind of work where you can invent different articulations. So that's what the checkup was doing. It was just, um, in, you know, varying a scale with different articulations, adding more in. Uh, so with this one, with Tavno Gobert, the Bible, uh, as we all know it, as... Um, Fantastic book. I only included two exercises from here. Uh, number four, which is uh, the, all our scales, and number 10, which are arpeggios. And I just want to share with you just a couple of ideas on how to do this, how to play these maybe in a different way than you're used to. Um, so actually, since we're on number 10, we could, we could talk about 10. Um, my teacher in Italy, Marzio Conti, he taught me how to do this one um, with this kind of, it's basically chunking it. Um, because at the time, I was kind of really a tight player. I was kind of gripping the flute and my vibrato was a little, I don't know what it was, but um, it, wasn't, it wasn't fluid. And so he wanted me to play this without vibrato. Um, and to just really get a sense of how to control this, the airstream without vibrato. Uh, and so then I would use this, uh, and we would do this kind of slowly too, but just going up and then breathing and restarting the C and going down to the low C. Breathing, starting from the low C, back up to the high C. So something like this. <laughs>
etc. for a while, right? And then gradually we'd start to bring in different articulations. If you'll notice, I'm going to explain a little bit some of these markings that I've written in on the C sharp. You'll see all these little R's at the time. That's what I needed to remind myself to release the grip of my tongue. Uh, so I would do um, something like, actually I'm caught in my flute. Okay, here we go. So so after as you as you start to leave the low C sharp release as you start to leave the E release as you start to leave the G release and all of a sudden it's like super easy and it it's almost like this flowing just happens when we do when we try not to grip, I think the, the tendency is to want to grip as we go up. But actually, if we release and let the air carry us up, it, it ends up being just way more efficient and way more fun. Yeah, so let's see. Um, let's maybe go back to Stallman real quick. And this is just a friendly reminder to please mute your mic because I hear a puppy. A puppy? <laughs> or a dog. I hear a dog oh. panting. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love puppies. Okay, so Robert Stallman, uh, who passed away recently, um, has so many great books. Uh, he's done a lot of, he's just published a lot and really wonderful musician. Um, and this book, uh, has been a really good comfort for me during times when I was uh, like when I was kind of rehabilitating uh, from tendonitis or whatever injury I happen to have. I've, I've been injured kind of three times throughout my career and all kind of related to just being too tight or trying to be someone I wasn't. <laughs> so um, be who you are. Use the body you have, you know, breathe the way you breathe, play the way you play and and uh, just Find out what works best for you. All right, so with this one, uh, I worked on this with, uh, I think it was with Tara. I'm not totally, I, I think that's what it was. But what I like to do with this one, I mean, you can play this one fast all day long and really have a great workout with scales and arpeggios and thirds. Um, but I like to do this one also with uh, sing and play. So like, sometimes I like to just drone. Let's see. So to get this the high C, I can either sing on a drone C or I can uh, maybe sing on a drone F because F can be also be, you know, the C is also found in the F harmonic series. So, so I, I would switch, switch it up, you know, sometimes, let's see. Um, so let's try to sing the F. So that's, um, I like to do that one because um, it helps me with ear training too. Uh, at that point, you know, just trying to keep that F, especially when I have like an E next to it or a G next to it. Uh, and at the end, 
why I missed that high E was because I was uh, not using enough air going into the flute and using too much air in the sound. So my, vo my voice sound was getting too loud. So I want to make sure that I keep the voice sound in balance with the flute to make sure that the flute sound is always a little louder. And that'll help, help you get over those kinds of hurdles, especially as you go into the high register. All right. So um, if you want to try one more, like we could actually go to the next slide, so to, to the Bernold. Okay, and I think this would be the last yeah. slide, and we want a little bit leave a little time for our questions. Okay, so for this one, uh, if you want to just scroll down, um, this is Bernard La Technique de Bouchure, a fa fantastic book. Oh my gosh, Philippe Bernard, he teaches at Paris Conservatory now. I think he used mm -hmm. to teach at the Lyon Conservatory, um, played with the opera in Lyon, and um, this is just a wonderful exercise for just getting the air flowing. Um, I like to also think about this one um, with, if you want, like, if you, if you feel really good, try to mix it up, like, play it sneaky, play it optimistically, play it, you know, play a, what would it sound like angry? Oh my gosh, let's see. Uh, No, and then um, like, or what if we, we did this like really like almost like a fairy or a fairy tale. And I'm gonna ignore the fourth day for now. I like the color better that like the second time. Yeah, for a fairy. Um, so like kind of coming up with new ways to play your vocalese. I mean, we, we, we often do a lot of vocalese, you know, just to get the air moving, but you can bring in different characters to practice. Uh, and I think that's a really great way to, to make these more interesting too. Not that they're not interesting already. Uh, another way to do this is also add a voice to it, you know, sing and play, play that low, sing that low C and try the whole thing. And then the last thing I included here was just the bull and uh, bubble sounds. Uh, this is for articulation. B and so like b. You would actually create the the seal with the lips for the b until you can really get a clear release with the lips. Uh, the e is a nice tricky one to start with. So I'm adding articulations too, because what I love about this exercise is it brings everything forward. If you're booing and hooing to try to match the b, you'll notice everything is pretty much right here. So maybe practice this, adding a few articulations too, and you'll notice that everything kind of just moves forward and all of a sudden your articulations are projecting better. So this is a really wonderful exercise. Another way you could do it too is, um, uh, if you're wanting power, because this is more for like mezzo forte, maybe to soft. I think you could also do it loud, but I think the the real gem of this is forte, uh, mezzo forte to soft. For loud, I would actually maybe do you know something like lift the legs and you know kind of ab 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 work, kind of getting the whole airstream behind it. Um, but yeah, so those are my warm ups that I usually go to. Uh, and I'd love to answer some questions. I see there's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah, and actually, before we get to those questions, Catherine, um, I actually got a couple requests. If people oh, yeah. want these uh, warm up exercises, is it okay if we put together a package and email it to our participants? Should they request yeah, it? Yeah, it's uh, everything's less than 10% of each book. So yeah, it's legal. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. And then let's go backwards. And I think we have a question from Mariana. Um, when you sing 
when you sustain a note while you're singing, does your throat ever tense up? If so, like, how do we remedy that? Yeah, so it, it does tense up. So you have to kind of release, you know, imagine the little R's as you go. So like, um, if I'm doing the, like the Stallman exercise, right? So I've already released like two or three times in there. Uh, while I'm trying to keep the air consistent, I can try to release wherever I feel the gripping along the path. Usually for me, it's like right here. I just kind of let it hang. So that's the trick is like, can you release and keep the airspeed the same? Or, you know, compensate so that you don't have a dip every time you release. It's like a bow, you know, like at the end of the bow, I'm not a violinist, so you can tell. <laughs> I'm not doing it right, but uh, I observe them and I see that the knuckles, you know, the knuckles are, are taking that shock, right? They're taking it, but you don't hear it at all. It's just a smooth, a smooth airstream or smooth, you know, bow stroke. Cool. Um, can you tell us the name of the Stallman book and as well as Bernard's, Bernard's oh, book? Oh, yeah. Oops. Uh, workout. Let's see. Robert Stallman's book is The Flute Workout. And I've written all over this one. Every time I get a realization or discovery, I write it on whatever it happens to be near me. <laughs> so uh, all my books have something on here. You'll win in the end if it's about the work you do. Jodie Foster said that. And it's right here. <laughs> You'll win in the end if it's about the work you do. That's a great quote. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that one. And what was the other book? Uh, uh, Bernot. Oh, yeah. Philippe Bernoulli, La Technique d'Embouchure, The Technique of the Embouchure, 218 exercises. He has a second book out. Um, I forgot the name of it right now, but um, it's got a kind of purple cover too. Purple, white. Yeah, and that one's also good too. Okay. And he's got everything in here about, like, anything related to the embouchure is in this book. Uh, you've got... Uh, vocalese, you've got articulation exercises, you've got dynamics, um, uh, let's see, you've got even orchestral excerpts in here, articulation, yeah, it's a really wonderful book. And since it we're on the topic, good. since we're on the topic of books, uh, before I yeah. go back to Michael's question, we have a question from Jen Gan. Can you show us the first Moise book that you used? The first Moise book, yeah. Marcel Moise. Comme j'ai pu maintenir ma forme, how I stayed huh. in shape. Stayed in shape. Yeah. And, I don't uh, own that book. I need to buy that book. It's so good. Actually, um, where, let's see, hold on. I have another book here. So um, this is also another loved book that we talked about, Robert Dick Tone Development. Mm -hmm. Follow your dreams, follow your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but I, yeah. I got this book because I have something in here related to the Moise. So this is actually a photocopy I made of my first teacher's, <laughs> Melissa Colgan Ablin's version of wow. form, How I Stayed in Shape. Wow. And it's got her note. It's got his signature on here. Let's see, right there. Marcel Moise, 1938. And, wow, that's uh, that's really special. It's so wonderful. And it's got his handwriting there. You know, he would write. He he wrote all this stuff. Look at his beautiful penmanship. Just so straight. I mean, it's so gorgeous. And then he's got, he wrote it all out. <laughs> There's the square and the, and the tenuto marking. Wow. Things yeah. you don't get on an iPad, right, Catherine? This you can't get on an iPad, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back to Michael's question for a second because I've been wondering about this one too. How does one develop a solid whistle tone? Oh my gosh, um, I'm still working on it. Uh, let's see. Solid, does it happen for you as you, get, as you get lower, it's more difficult, yeah? As you get lower, it's more difficult. It's easier to start in the highest notes. Like, uh, let's see. So it's high C. 
I mean, it still wiggles. Um, Oh man, you get the idea, right? It's, <laughs> yeah, so as you go down, it gets a little harder. Um, the one that we did was D flat, right? I'm like getting two D flats, hold on. Yeah, so it's, um, I think the more you do it, if you spend a little bit of time every day, I think that is going to help. If you try to do it just out of the blue, it's it's going to be really challenging to get that airstream super accurate, you know, in that in a whistle tone kind of way. And it's just such a good exercise for like a reality check to see how tense you are, because the whistle tones are not going to happen when your tense. Right. You have to be a hundred thousand percent relaxed before yeah. things come out. So thousand percent. Yeah, exactly. you like that? Yeah. Yeah, you and, don't uh, even need. It's almost like you don't even need an embouchure. Mm -hmm. So that's really neat. And then actually, um, Ada Jones, uh, who is the professor at Texas State, uh, who is actually our guest artist for next week's warm up, uh, she put it in the comment. Uh, someone in the M NFA series said, really purse the lip forward to bring out the airstream close to the opposite wall. So the riser of the embouchure hole. Oh, so that seems good. like a, another good tip. And maybe, Ada, mm -hmm. you can elaborate it a little bit more next week when we do your warm up class. So, um, and I think we're coming up to the end of our warm-up session. Uh, Catherine, any last words, any uh, last minute magical tips to share with us? Oh my gosh. Um, let's see. I said be you, right? Yes, you said be, uh, yourself. be yourself and use your body. I put that in the chat room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> use your own body. <laughs> Don't try to be somebody else's body. Um, yeah, I think if we... Um, if we allow ourselves kind of like to remind ourselves of what we talked about at the beginning, like be teachable, you know, allow yourself to, to be open to learn in, in your practice session, allow yourself to be the width that you are. I always thought it was like, you know, like wider than I was. I don't know. Like I always thought I was kind of wide this way. And I wouldn't, I would try to not be so wide, but once I became, allowed myself to be as wide as I am, all of a sudden the resonance was there. And I'm like, oh, just have your width, have your depth, have your height. You know, I'm kind of tall and, you know, sometimes this is what we're taught to do to just stick in or stick, not stick out. But, you know, be, use the body you have. It's so beautiful. Everyone's so different. And, and it makes our whole musical world that much richer when we have so many different bodies and so many different souls and hearts making music. So be your authentic self. There you go. There be you your go. <laughs> self. Thanks, Ethan. Great. And just want to really thank everybody for joining us today. If you have any questions, uh, please email us. You can reach me or Daniel at info, I-N-F-O, at Burkhart.com. And just want to thank Catherine Really, I mean, thank you for your wisdom. You are a beautiful person. It's, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this session. Oh. And um, everybody be well, stay healthy, and then hope to see you next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern with Ada Jones. All right, everybody, take Thanks care. So I'll much. see you next time. Happy practicing. Bye. Happy practicing. <laughs> Bye. Bye.